Hello game developers. Um, once again, I'm Matt, and this is Let's Make Pong, Episode 3. Now, when we left off last episode, we had just finished making our game object class here. We had defined a bounds, a position, and a velocity, and created some accessors and some helper methods to work with that. Um, the last couple of episodes have run longer than I want them to. Uh, I kind of want to target like 15 minutes for a good size. I'm going to try and get as much done in that time as possible. So that's what I'm going to try to do from now on. And so to just set some quick goals for this episode, I'd like to get our our uh, ball and our paddle classes up and going. And I'd like to get some rendering started so that we can see what we're working with. And if we have time, um, we may start on some ball physics so we can get something moving and feel like we're making some good progress. But uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, first thing we're going to do, we're going to make a new Java class, and we'll just call it ball. Now we want our ball class to extend the uh, game object class that we made last time. So we'll do that. We'll automatically create our constructor here. Now the constructor we made for game object last time um, expects us to pass in a width and a height. Now, the automatic constructor here set up a width and a height um, constructor perimeters for our ball class. We don't necessarily need this. We could pass the width and the height in if we anticipate changing the size of the ball when we create it. Um, but we're not going to do that for now, I think. We'll just have a static size. Um, we'll... I'm not sure how big we actually want it to be yet. We'll just do 32 by 32 for now. Uh, we'll, that may go up, that may go down, and that may work out just fine. We will have to see once we get it on screen and start playing with it. And Just thinking about what we're going to need the ball to do in the future, how it's going to react in the game. I think we're going to make a helper method here. This actually needs to be a public constructor since we need to public make a make a public instance of that um, we're going to make a helper method here called reflect and it's going to take uh, two boolean values one for the x-axis and one for the y-axis and that way we can call reflect and tell it to reflect on the x or the y-axis automatically and when I say reflect this is what's going to handle the bouncing of the ball when it hits something either a paddle or the top or the bottom of the play field. And to do that, it's really easy. All you do is you determine you determine where the ball hits. So if it's coming down, say the ball is traveling down this way, like follow the mouse cursor, and it hits the bottom here, we want it to reflect and just go back this way because it comes down, hits, reflects, goes back. It bounces around the screen like that. And to do that, all you have to do is when you hit, you know it's a uh, vertical collision so all you have to do is flip the vertical velocity and you keep the horizontal velocity the same so you come down here you hit the vertical velocity is flipped and you do that by multiplying it by negative one so if it's a negative velocity that'll make it positive and if it's a positive velocity that'll make it negative and then the uh, horizontal velocity stays the same so it continues traveling in this direction but in the opposite direction vertically comes down hits bounces and goes that way um, that may make more sense when you actually see it happen but trust me it'll work so what we want to do we'll just say if x I didn't give a help I didn't I didn't give myself a uh, setter for the individual velocity components and that's fine we'll just play with it like this we'll just do vector2 velocity equals get velocity then we'll do velocity x times equals negative one if x velocity dot x times equals negative one and if y, 
velocity dot y times equals negative one. That way we can control it all with one method. We can reflect the x, we can reflect the y, or we can do them both if needed. And uh, we'll just tidy this up. No reason for that to take up all that space. There we go. And that'll help us um, do reflections there, save us some typing. I actually need to reset the velocity. We use our set velocity method there. And that'll set it that way. All right, that's good. Um, handling collisions, I think we'll do that in the actual game class in the uh, update loop in the update loop so we don't need any helper classes for that nothing that needs to be ball specific anyway and um, I think that's good for now we'll work with that and if we need anything else we'll come back to it and add on to it so we'll go ahead and make a new Java class and call it paddle and do the same thing we're going to extend from game object Implement our constructor here. Same thing, we're just going to have static size paddles. And again, we don't know how big we actually want them to be, so we'll just kind of guess it for now. We'll make it the same width as the ball, uh, but we'll make it three times the size of the ball for now. So, what is that, 96? So, we'll go with that for now. And, and, the only thing we're really going to need to do with the paddle is move it around, which we can already do using our velocity um, getters and setters we already have implemented. Um, collision with the paddles will be handled in the game loop when we update the ball. So anything else, the paddle probably doesn't need anything else. So the same thing with the ball, if we need anything else we'll come back to it. But this just lets us create some paddle objects and work with them. So that's it for our objects we need right now. So let's go ahead and get those here in our game class. We'll make a ball instance. And we'll make two paddles. We'll just call them paddle one and paddle two for now. And we can go ahead and make new ones of those. And so now our game has access to a ball and to two paddles, which is great. So that's squared away. Let's talk about rendering. Let's get that up and going. Um, you can render a game in a variety of ways. Most games use textures, graphics that they create externally, and port them into the game, and then use uh, sprite batches, which we'll talk about um, in the future, to display those textures on the screen. Now, since Pong is a pretty simple game, it's all primitive shapes, as we saw in that screenshot in uh, yesterday's episode. It's all squares and rectangles and lines. Nothing fancy, nothing we need to create externally and bring into the game. So luckily, libgdx provides us with a class called Shape Renderer. And what that does is it just uses the OpenGL backend to render basic primitive shapes to the screen. And when I say primitive shape, I mean basic polygons, things like lines, cones, triangles, squares, um, circles, that sort of thing. And we access that through the shape renderer class. And we'll just call that shape renderer. And if you, when you use the shape render, you need to make sure you don't try to create an instance of it um, until you're inside of your create method. And that's because the graphics device that uh, libgdx uses in the background that OpenGL uses isn't actually ready and accessible until create has been called. So if we were to bring this uh, constructor up here, if we were to take that out, bring that up here and call it when we ran our program we would get an error because um, it's just not accessible yet so now we have our shape renderer and we're going to use that in our render function in our draw function actually uh, but the first thing we need to do is clear the screen um, 
because if we don't clear the screen, what happens is every frame, the, um, there's, a, there's a back buffer where everything gets drawn to. So if we don't clear that out, after we're done with each frame, the contents will remain there, and you'll get weird kind of blur smearing going on, which can look cool, but it's not really what we're after right now. And to do that, we access the GL functions, and we went through our uh, GDX static accessor thing, like, I, like we looked at yesterday for graphics. Um, we're going to use the GL common one here. And we're going to call GL clear. And it wants an integer, um, just a mask that tells it what you're clearing. Because you can clear a bunch of different things. You can clear the, the back color buffer, which is what we're going to use. You can clear the depth buffer. You can clear the stencil buffer. Uh, those are not things we need to worry about at the moment. But um, we want the GL color buffer bit. And that just tells OpenGL to clear our back buffer and clear the clear the color component of it. Everything else can be left intact because we're not going to touch it and use it right now. Um, and if we run this, should be okay. Nothing visibly is going to change. It's clearing the screen every frame now. We don't see it because the default clear color is black. If we were to change that to something else, say we wanted the background of our game to be... Uh, a fancy red. We can do that as well. We can do um, GL clear color before we actually clear it. And it'll want um, four float values from 0 to 1 um, and determines the color component of each one. So it wants red, green, blue, and an alpha. So you can have it semi transparent if you want it to be. Um, so say we just want that red color. We just do one for full red. 0 green, 0 blue, and 1 for opaque, that's full alpha. If it, was Z, if it was 0 alpha, it would be transparent, so you just wind up with black again. So if we run that, we should have a bright red screen, because it's being cleared. And there you go. So you can play with that if you want to, but we're just going to stick with a uh, black screen. Stay traditional here. See, 0, 0, 0, all black. There we go. Now, what's going to be happening in happening in this draw method? Um, this is where we're going to render any everything that happens in the game. We'll be drawing our paddles here. We'll be drawing the ball, and we'll be drawing the uh, the score, and we'll be drawing anything that happens happens with the field. Uh, mostly just that dividing line, like we looked at yesterday. Now, we could all do it all in this one method. Um, but we're going to split it up just in case in the future when we start playing with the code and and working on improving it. If we want to do more than just render a square for the ball, uh, if we want to add particle trails to it or do some kind of weird blurring or if we want to render multiple balls, it might be useful to have that all encapsulate, encapsulated out into, into a separate method. So we'll do that. We'll make a new method called draw ball. And then we're going to start using our shape renderer here. Now, the shape renderer works in a batch system. So what happens is, shape renderer has a method on it called begin. Shape, and it has a perimeter for a shape type. So we call it be begin, and we tell it what kind of shape we're going to be rendering for this, for this batch, right? And you can only do one at a time. So if you want to do a field rectangle, you pick that. If you pick box, you can do circle, field circle, field cone, field triangle, line, a point, rectangle, triangle. Those are the options available to us. We're going to be using filled rectangles. That's just a, a solid rectangle that we can define. If you wanted something uh, that was just an outline of a rectangle, there's just the rectangle shape type. And then we'll go ahead and when you after you call begin you have to call end and then all your rendering happens in between here this is where you make all your shape renderer calls and no rendering actually happens until you call shape renderer end because what happens is it batches all that up 
and just for efficiency's sake, and then sends it all out to the video card at once. So it's just an efficiency thing. It's faster if it all happens at once that way. And so we'll move our draw ball method in here. Since we're going to be working with nothing but filled rectangles, we can do all of our drawing inside of this one shape renderer begin call. But say we wanted to do our paddles as rectangles and our ball as a circle, we could do that, but we'd have, we'd have to do that in between two different shape renderer calls. So, say in here, you know, we had our draw paddle method using the filled rectangles, we'd have to come down here and do a shape renderer begin shape type circle and then do our ball that way. Um, we could have the shape renderer begin and end inside the individual methods, like we could put it here inside the draw ball, but you don't want to call begin and end over and over and over if you don't have to, because that will just drop your frame rate some. It's more inefficient to do it that way. Or I should say it's more efficient to do multiple calls within one batch. But we'll be doing everything as rectangles for now, so we can do it all within that one batch. So we'll come down here to the draw ball method. And starting out, it's going to be really simple. All we need to do is call shape renderer filled rec. There's a method for each type of shape that you can uh, draw. If we look at the methods here, it's a lot of a lot, a lot of code in here, but. There's these methods for line, there's method for rectangle, there's method for filled rectangle, um, box, circle, all of them are in here. And so you have to call the one for the shape type that you're currently using. So we're currently drawing filled rectangles, so we call the filled rectangle method. And it has two constructors that you can, or uh, two method signatures that you can use. Um, it wants an X and a Y position, a width and a height for both of them. And the secondary one lets you specify uh, specific colors for each corner of the rectangle. And uh, it should do automatic blending in between that, so you can get some cool looking effects that way. We'll probably just leave it white for now, so we'll just use the first one, use a default color. And to get these values, we want to pull them from our ball object that we created earlier. So the first one it wants is the X position, so we'll use that get X method we used earlier. It wants a Y position, so we'll get the get Y. It wants the width of the rectangle, so we're going to do the uh, width of the ball. Uh, I don't have, I didn't give myself a uh, easy get width, but we can do it based on the bounds. Like that. And that will draw the ball at its current position and uh, at its current width and height. And then it'll come back out of this method in the shape renderer um, batch, send it off to be drawn. So if we run this now, we should see the ball in the bottom left of our screen. So let's test that out. Yep, yeah, there it is. It's a 32 by 32 ball. It's pretty big. I'll probably wind up making that a little bit smaller. Um, and yesterday I, I made um, I misspoke when I talked about the rectangle and how it's positioned. Um, yesterday I, I said it, it was positioned by the top left corner, and that's incorrect for OpenGL. Um, we can actually use this to talk about origins and what that means. So. I misspoke because I'm used to direct X, which is a different rendering um, method as opposed to OpenGL. And in direct X, the origin of the screen, the, the point in the screen where X equals zero and Y equals zero, uh, that's in the top left of the screen, right? So this is zero, zero, and then X is positive this way, and Y is positive this way, right? But in OpenGL, it's different. 
The origin is down here in the bottom left. This is 0, 0. X is positive this way, which is the same. But now Y is positive going up. So there are ways libgdx does support changing that around if you feel the need to, but I prefer just to keep it to the default and just you know try to keep that in mind and try to work with that. So we'll keep that in mind in the future, but just remember that rectangles in uh, OpenGL and libgdx are defined by their bottom left corner. So we'll keep that in mind and work with that. Um, but we're at about 20 minutes now. Uh, we have our rendering up. We can see the ball. We have our ball class and our paddle class done. Um, so next episode, we will work on getting that ball moving so that we can see it. And we'll probably do collision there and have it bouncing and reflecting off the boundaries of the screen or the boundaries of the field, I should say. Um, so until next time, thanks for joining me. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. You can always hit me up on my Twitter, uh, which will be in the description. And uh, as always, the code is being uploaded to a public repository. That's also in the description. So if you want to download each episode, it is tagged by episode, so you can keep track of it that way. And you can download the code, follow along, and play with it um, in between episodes if you feel the need. All right. Thanks for joining me.